subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. I'm with Haseeb Drabu, the former finance minister of uh, Jammu and Kashmir with the PDP, the People's Democratic Party, which took power in Jammu and Kashmir in 2014. Mr. Drabu, welcome to The Print. Thank you. It's been a year, Mr. Drabu, since uh, Article 370 was revoked in Jammu and Kashmir last August 5, 2019. In this past year, your first comments on what has happened in the now Union Territory. Well, lots has happened, of course, but I'm intrigued by the sudden interest of media and uh, commentators just because it's an anniversary. What happened between 5th of August 2019 and 5th of August 2020? Mm -hmm. Nobody has really spoken about it. Um, the biggest surprise for me in the course of one year is that last year, this time, it was the Kashmir policy of a political party. BJP's policy on Kashmir, abrogation of 370, something that they've been advocating since 1952. In the course of this last year, what was the policy of a political party seems to have become the national policy on Kashmir. In what way? The, there is no alternative view on Kashmir, except the view that BJP has been advocating for the last, as I said, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Political parties, whether it was Congress or the Communists or the Federalists or the regional parties, all had a view on Kashmir. If you remember 1983, the biggest conclave of opposition leaders was uh, done in Vijayawada by NTR and then Farooq Abdullah invited him for a three-day conclave, which resulted in some dilution of the 48th Amendment. Now, nobody is speaking against what BJP has done in terms of constitutional abrogation of Article 370. Why? Yes, there have been some comments about how it was done. Not a single political party today in the country has said that this is wrong, if they believe so, that this is wrong. And then if and when we come to power, we will examine the constitutional validity of what has been done. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of... Uh, you know, uh, there was a gentleman, uh, Devkan Barua, the Congress guy from, I think, Assam, yeah. who once made a statement that Indira is India. Today, the opposition has announced it in the course of one year that BJP is India because there is no other view emerging on Kashmir. But why do you think this has happened? Why this massive silence across the political spectrum? I don't know. I, I, as I said, this is my biggest surprise in the course of uh, last one year. It's not just Kashmir. I mean, if you look at the larger politics also, there is no alternative view today on any matter for that, for that fact. But it has kind of got concretized in a, in a I'm surprised that the, the kind of um, constitutional change that took place on 5th August has huge implications on the federalism of India. Now, you can't just convert a state into a union territory or, I mean, that's one side of it, or abrogate what is essentially a social contract. The constitution is a social contract between people, between uh, state and uh, the center. No, none of these regional parties, be it the DMK or the uh, Trinamool Congress or the Samajwadi Party, or, none of them, they of course recognize that federalism is under threat if this kind of a thing happens here. It will happen elsewhere also. But nobody is speaking about it. Which really means that Article 370, as it was the Constitution of India, was not aligned to the collective conscience of India. You should just see how the civil society of the country has celebrated the abrogation of 370. Not that it really means anything for them in material terms, mm -hmm. but the way it has been positioned, packaged, done, delivered, has resulted in a huge goodwill for the BJP in the rest of the country. Let's not, let's not deny that. Whatever may have happened in Kashmir, whatever may be the resentment in Kashmir or the silence in Kashmir. You all talk about, about the silence in Kashmir. What bothers me, apart from the silence in Kashmir, is the silence in the rest of the country. No, Who but the, the, no, the, right. silence in, the silence in the rest of the country is a manifestation of the power that the BJP has. It has a majority in the Lok Sabha. 
uh, there's very little opposition that is manifest. You know that the Congress party hasn't been able to articulate its, um, you know, an, an opposing point of view, if you like, the, the a major opposition party, a grand old party, if you like. But you are happy to organize a Shaheen Bagh and you have nothing to say about Kashmir, not even a one day's bund, a token bund, a symbolic Bharat bund, because it was done, something wrong had been done, if at all they think it was wrong. Not even that. I mean, it's not fair to say there is no opposition. I mean, it's, democracy may be about the majority, the will of the majority. It also has respect for minority. Someone must articulate. I and mean, what prevents media from eternalizing these things, saying that this was wrong or it should be reviewed. I haven't seen anything. Yes, there are token kind of things that, you know, more on the fact of how it was done or not on what was done. So, so you, I think that's, the, that, that's a big message coming from the, from, from, from the rest of the country. So two questions from there. One is that uh, Article 370, in a sense, has been whittled down over the years, as long back as when Jawaharlal Nehru was prime minister, um, after the China conflict uh, in since, you know, after 1962, even what do you make of that? The fact that the BJP, you know, even removed the fig, the fig leaf, if you like, of article 370, what does that mean? Well, yes. I mean, I think that's, that in some ways tells you the whole story of 370, because what has happened is even as you said, even as early as 1963, the prime minister told the parliament that uh, we have, uh, hollowed out 370. Guzairlal Nanda, who was the Home Minister, said in December of 63 that uh, whether 370 stays or not actually uh, makes no difference because we have taken out all the elements of it. And that time he used the metaphor of a tunnel, that it's a tunnel or a bridge through which much traffic has flown. That bridge has now become a barrier and uh, it has been demolished. So I want to put, if I were to kind of uh, present this, it is more like that, you know, on August 4th, the, uh, uh, 2019, the Article 370 that stood was the biggest fraud perpetuated by the government of India or politically by the Congress on the people of JNK. Because between 51 uh, and uh, 1986, it was completely hollowed out. And equally, what did BJP uh, abrogate? In fact, I wrote a piece in 2015 saying, what is there to abrogate? There's nothing left of it. But yes, there was a whole element of 370 for the people of GNK. That it was an emotional support, a psychological thing, a part of their whole history and whatever. But technically speaking, there was not much uh, left. In, there was nothing left in the article as far as I'm concerned. Yes, Article 35A did have prevention on, specifically on the issue of land. Yeah. And that came up not because of any constitutional arrangement at all. It was an act during the Maharaja's time, 1927 State Subject Act, which was then introduced in the parliament uh, as 25A. That abrogation has had a material impact, yes, but not 370. And yet, uh, Dr. Drabu, when uh, you were finance minister in the PDP, which won power in 2014, and you aligned, your party aligned with the BJP. So you should know what the BJP wants. Yes, of course. Now, there were a couple of things that led to the whole decision of the alliance, but that we can talk about separately. What is important in, in this alliance was, there was an agreement between the PDP and the BJP, for which I was a negotiator, where it was signed, an agenda of alliance was drafted jointly with the BJP, in which the first part of the agenda, if you go and see it now, it's available on the net, it's always been there, status quo on the special constitutional position of JNP. That was the first term, as in the first condition of that whole, what we call the governance alliance, because we realized, and that time, um, you know, it was, uh, we were trying to see how, what Mufti Saab that time called, subsequently the North Pole, South Pole Alliance, GLE was that how do we put together a governance uh, alliance which in some way papers over the ideological differences between the BJP and the PDP. So we arrived at a consensus document which actually said in exactly as many words that the status quo on 
special constitutional position of JNK will be maintained. It was on that basis that alliance was done. Of course, there was a caveat right at the beginning of the thing. To be fair, I must say that also that this agreement will hold till the alliance is working. That's right. So that was pretty much a kind of which is which is fair because you know if the alliance breaks, then the conditions break with it. But the fact remains that. Uh, when the alliance was done, it was on the explicit condition of not just 370, but the special constitutional position, which includes 370 and 35A. So, were you surprised? I mean, okay, so before that, did Mufti Saab trust the BJP not to undermine this uh, status quo or this the spirit of Article 370? Look, he, he, was a, he did this alliance... I must say he has passed away and I probably worked with him closest on that thing during that period. He did not do it out of compulsion. He did it out of conviction. And one of the things that he genuinely believed in was that Mr. Modi has the mandate to resolve JLK. And he was completely convinced of the fact that there must be a you know, uh, relationship with BJP because they have a mandate that represents India, which with benefit of hindsight, I think was right. I mean, the mandate to rule India. To the mandate to rule India, absolutely. And uh, so there was that. Uh, second, of course, was a electoral compulsion. I use the word compulsion, not ideological but electoral. Then nobody had a mandate. You know, we had uh, PDP had that time 27 seats, BJP had 25, marginal difference. People, those who pray, accuse PDP or me individually of bringing BJP into the play should know that in the 14 elections, BJP was the single largest party in JNK on vote share. They had 23% votes. PDP had 22, NC had 21. Number one. Number two, which also drove Mufti Saab to the alliance, was the fact that PDP had not got any seats out of Jammu Plains. Nor did Congress, nor did National. Yeah. The only political party that got. So he felt very, very strongly that if he doesn't tie up with BJP, it would negate the mandate given by Jammu. And he did not want to run. He was very clear on that. It was an article of faith for him. I will not run the state unless I have Jammu on board. Those two were the decisive reasons for him to get into an alliance with the BJP. As far as I know. Rest, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know what other things could have driven it, but this is what my understanding of it is. So what has since transpired is that after the alliance was broken, uh, your alliance with the BJP, the PDP's alliance with the BJP, and we've seen in the last couple of years, the political instability in Kashmir and in, uh, in the state, which then resulted in the formal abrogation of Article 370 last year. Were you surprised that that a party that you had aligned, that your party had aligned with the BJP and that this was the end result of it? Of course I was surprised. I mean, there's no denying that. Not only surprised, very disappointed and very humiliated. Uh, individually as a Kashmiri. Humiliated? As a Kashmiri, of course, no doubt about it. I mean, felt I, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, it was not just a surprise. It was a bit of a shock and not a bit of a shock, but quite a shock. There are a variety of reasons for that. One, of course, the uh, entire negotiations and the alliance in the initial phases with Mutsa was there was done in good faith. And uh, it was done with a, with a positive intent. Um, I think that's the sense I got. Maybe I read it wrong, but I'll, I can still say that it was done in good faith and in, with good intentions. That we, let's try and focus on the developmental part of it. Let's try and see what we can do. Uh, those, and if you see the, the general alliance, it's a pretty elaborate document on what we wanted to do. So, uh, so when this happens, of course, there's no denying that uh, it was it was quite a shock to see. The other reason why all of us, not just me, um, all of us in Kashmir, somehow believed that nobody could ever abrogate 370, technically speaking. Mm. There were a variety of reasons for that. I mean, it's not that this is the first time. As I said, it's a history of BJP to try right from Jansan Praja Sabha 50 yeah. till today. The RSS has been saying, it's like, you know, it's not a surprise that they have suddenly uh, done, you know, this. done this. But there was an, uh, this whole thing that even in Vajpayee's time, when Prime Minister, when Vaj, Vajpayee was the Prime Minister, they had brought out a full report, I'm given to understand, 
on the complexity of abrogating 370 and he finally took a view that he shall not do it. So we were led to believe as we grew up trying to, and then we kind of went to govern that there was absolutely no way in which you could abrogate 370. So both of it, the audacity of doing it constituting a manner certainly shook us. I mean, shook me for sure. Okay. What, what, what else? Well, I also feel that, uh, you know, Kashmir was not a Hindu Muslim problem. At least not as far as I saw it. But now it seems to have got into this binary framework of Hindu Muslim. And that will have uh, quite a few implications on, uh, on the way things go forward. <clears throat> so now I think there is this whole communalization of Kashmir, if you were to call it. I think that's where it is headed. And I, and I just hope and pray that it doesn't go down that road any further. The, co the communalization of Kashmir, uh, if, if, you know, if that's what the word you're using, we've seen since the late 1980s when insurgency began in the valley. Not really, except for that one uh, episode, a historic episode, I'm not denying that, that uh, was when the Kashmiri pundits were forced to leave the valley. Yeah. No, Kashmir but also that to get into the communalization as it were. I, I take that point. I mean, I'm not saying it. But the generalization of that this is a Hindu uh, versus a Muslim state, a Muslim majority state. Now that is something that uh, I don't think was the basis of the relationship. It's getting into that and that can get very, very complicated. I think the, uh, the government of India has for the first time absolved Pakistan of any, uh, you know, fueling insurgency in Kashmir by saying 370 was the reason for insurgency. If a constitutional provision was the reason for insurgency, then what scope does it leave to argue Pakistan was during the insurgency? Which it was, no doubt about that. Mm. But if I were to look at it from the narrow rubric of uh, the, the way it was packaged, what was said? That 370 has hampered development and hence it's being abrogated yeah. and 370 has fueled insurgency. That is why it's being abrogated, right? Mm. There was no mention of any political agenda. Though, honestly, I think they should have said exactly that that this is something we have committed to our people right from 1952 and we are finally doing it without putting it under the rubric of uh, economic development which doesn't hold water or absolving Pakistan of fueling insurgency or supporting insurgency in JNK by saying that 370 caused insurgency. How an article of uh, the Constitution of India for 70 years could be the reason for insurgency is something that needs to be debated much more carefully and much more sensitively. So the BJP's or the Jansang's uh, slogan of Ek Naam, Ek Vidhan, Ek, uh, ek, ek Vidhan, Ek Samvidhan, Ek Nishan. Ek Nishan. You think that is now apparent and that's the reason why this has happened? No, no but of course it is, no doubt about it. And, uh, and the BJP says it openly. Uh, but the, the, this, uh, if there is one city, I said, I was telling somebody, if there is one city in India that can lay a claim to being the Nagpur, uh, next to Nagpur, on ideology of uh, Hindutva, then it is Jammu. Uh, in 1951, they had long, strong presence of the Praja, which was a subset of the Jansa. And in fact, that's what morphed into becoming Janta Party today, the BJP. If you trace back the history, it starts from there. So uh, there was an element uh, of that. And I think 50 or 52, and uh, one of their biggest leaders, uh, Shyam Prasad Mukherjee died in that agitation when he was. That's right. So the, 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 it has historical moorings. It's not that it's a current here and now kind of a decision. There is a historical basis to it. You're, the former uh, Chief Minister of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, your former colleague Mehbooba Mufti, is still under house arrest. Um, it's been over a year. Lots of habeas corpus petitions have been either thrown out by the Jammu and Kashmir High Court or are still pending. It doesn't make sense. Why is she still inside? She's the it doesn't make sense to you because you're seeing it in a certain framework. You're not willing to accept that this is what, as I said in the beginning, that this is what the civil society of India wants. This is how the judiciary and institution, yeah, it wants in a sense of not objecting to it. It's, as I said, that 370 was celebrated. There was no reason for celebration of, of in, in, this, in a 
non political civil society generally speaking hmm. courts why should 370 not be heard right it's you talk about mehba mufti she was she has been arrested or she's she is in uh, house arrest post abrogation of 370 370 itself from that day onwards has been sitting in the supreme court nobody has uh, heard that no bench has been yet why not so what the point being that why are you surprised and why doesn't it make sense the judiciary an institution of civil society is a part of this whole setup so let me ask you uh, hasib manoj sinha a bjp politician a long time bjp politician is now going has gone to uh, the state uh, to the unit you to to uh, to jammu and kashmir as the lieutenant governor the third in the last couple of years ostensibly to reopen the political process what do you think do you think he you know what, what do you think he's going to encounter what well, to the extent that a, they have now appointed a politician and not a bureaucrat it has two things for one historical if you look at the 10 governors of the erstwhile state of jnp they were all out apart from the army uh, personnel as in the army chief and all yeah like krishna rao and others the best and the brightest bureaucrats were sent as governors of uh, as governor of jnp whether it was bhagwan sahai lk jha bk nehru the the outstanding bureaucrats so there has been a tradition so even uh, mr murmu went was part of that tradition there were only two uh, two governors uh, uh, actually only one governor was political that was mr satyal malik and the less said the better so i do not like to comment on what he did there but he uh, suffices to say that he undermined the chair and the gravitas of the governor in his state but that is a sign in what way? let's hope sorry in what way the way he handled it till the 4th of april saying there is no question of any application i have met the prime minister the way he kind of the whole facts machine episode happened and the way kind of you know uh, he came with this thing that i am here to resolve every issues and what subsequently happened so um, so i don't know what to make of it but all i can do is hope that he actually uh, does um, resolve some of the start the political process though my belief is and i'm very very clear on that that there can be no political activity in jnt or in kashmir valley i'll speak only about kashmir valley unless there is an alternative view on kashmir in rest of the country no, but if you so that is that is what will spur the political activity now today for instance if you were to release let's talk you talk since talk about my bomb thing the talk of there are only basically a few accepted people who are a leader who have who have large parties pdp nc and others right now in 1983 when uh, farooq abdullah was under stress and he was kind of you know uh, dismissed and stuff mm. who did he reach out to he didn't reach out to the people of course he reached out to the people in his own you know uh, area but he reached out to the political leadership in in rest of the country right he had a he had an opposition conclave in 1983 after attending the ntr conclave in vijayawada he then invited i think 72 uh, political parties or and uh, had a three day conclave hmm. so he reached out to a larger audience and that was the whole idea that you know if you are going to have a political process you want some redressal of some of the things that have happened because of a political party or a particular person then you enlarge the thing go to a larger con- because you are a part of this country right yeah so politically otherwise socially maybe less so economically maybe less so but otherwise you are a part of this country in terms of the politics of it right mm-hmm. so who do they reach out to who is there in india today who a mehbooba mufti or a farooq abdullah or a umar abdullah or a sajad doon can call up and say that look let's kind of do something i can't do a rally in srinagar can i do a rally in uh, vijayawada can i do a rally in gohati can i do a rally in calcutta raise the that is how political activity will start you can't just expect political activity to start when there is no other view in the rest of the country what will they talk about now what are they now what is happening in the absence of any alternative view in the in rest of the country what are you doing there are people in the valley who are saying okay give us grant us statehood now that's a foregone conclusion it's a part of the package the home minister said it yeah that it's not that you will forever be condemned to ut it's only a temporary thing 
maybe one year, maybe one and a half years, two years, whatever. So that is a foregone conclusion. On that, to revive politics in Kashmir, I don't think it's going to happen. So instead, what is cooked in the kitchen doesn't get decided in the kitchen. Hmm. If there is political activity in on Kashmir in the rest of the country, you will see a revival of political activity in JNK. I think it's more important to you know look at uh, just as we have focused on the silence in Kashmir and not the silence in the rest of the country, we must focus on the politics in the rest of the country rather than just Kashmir. No, fair enough. But you see, listen, right now the situation on the ground is, and since we're all realists, the situation on the ground is that these regional parties of Jammu and Kashmir are circumscribed within the state or within the union territory. So activity within that space has to be generated. Whether or not it's generated, you're saying it should be generated in, in the rest of the country first. That's a, that's a separate argument. But I'm asking... No, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's really linked because, you know, what no, is done... It is linked, but what is... No, Jyoti, one point I want. By average of 370, you have killed the mainstream politics in the valley. Here are these guys who go and talk about how the accession is valid, everything is valid, and they are the guys who are behind bar. Will, what will they go to the people with? If anything that 370 has done, it has separate, strengthened the separatist sentiment in the valley. Because you have discredited the mainstream. There is no space left for them. I said in a, a, a column I wrote about a year back, the, I, mean, I think it was immediately after 5th August, I said now you will have only two sets of people in Kashmir. You will have, either have separatists or you will have stooges. Because you have left no scope for these people. Now, if you want to give them some breathing space, you need to actually build an alternative view in the rest of the country where they can reach out to. That will revive it. Revive, you know, making a demand or a political activity based on converting into statehood is not going to revive it. This is how I understand it. Quite possibly. What, is, what about the PDP and the NC, for example, the two big parties? Uh, what do they do going forward? I don't know. I'm neither a part of NC nor PDP, but uh, I, I, all I can say is they're in a very, very tight spot. In a very, very tight spot. No question. I mean, the, what they've spent their lives uh, working towards has suddenly been, uh, you see, for... for because a, a lot of people, a lot of people also, after the revocation of 370, a lot of people were also very angry with um, Farooq Abdullah, Omar Abdullah, Mehbooba Mufti, the big leaders of these regional parties, and were quite furious with them. So, where in, in the state or outside the state? No, inside the state. They were so, how, why, why is it so unnatural? I mean, is, aren't there people angry with Manmohan Singh today on the streets? Aren't there people angry with Rahul Gandhi on the streets? Are there people not angry with uh, Akhilesh uh, Yadav in UP? Are there not people angry with uh, uh, Mamta Banerjee in Calcutta? So, they were angry, so what? I mean, the, Tell me one place where everybody is very happy with everybody in, in the politics of this country. When has that happened? So why does this become an issue that people you know, uh, did not, uh, are ang very angry with them? Yeah, they might have to deliver on governance. We didn't deliver on governance as much as we wanted to. For sure. There were a lot of constraints. Yes. So if people are unhappy, they have a right to be unhappy. And if they are today kind of, you know, not reaching out to Omar Uppla or Mehbah Mufti, so be it. A lot of like, corruption. A lot of corruption, it is being said. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's something that I have a view on, but uh, I, I, honestly speaking, I, I think that's just one more thing that, you know, you're now making out every Kashmiri to be a corrupt uh, person, which is very, very unfair and extremely humiliating. Uh, it's not that, I'm not saying there's not corruption. I'm sure there is, there must be, but it's not the only place in the world where there's corruption. And if you have addressed, not address it elsewhere in the country, address it in the same manner uh, there also, but don't make it the prime thing that these people are corrupt, therefore they have to go. That's not correct. So, if these parties, if the region, if these parties are being uh, discredited or marginalised, what's the option? Is the option uh, the the BJP? Uh, That's for the government to think what the option is for the people to decide. I would not, uh, having been in politics for five years, I would not venture that kind of uh, guess right now. All I'm saying is that uh, you need to listen to the silences in the valley. And don't treat this as uh, that this is, you know, temporary and it will pass. It's a difficult time. And if you are genuinely interested in reviving politics, political activity, mainstream political activity in JNK, 
better look at politics outside the uh, outside the state. But the silence that you speak of, what does it speak to you? What does it say to you? It's a form of protest, of course, for sure. I mean, at uh, at one level, it's a protest. It's also a, as I said, you know, in some ways, what it has done is that you may have had you may have had stakeholders, you may have had groups who had a grievance against government of India, right? Mm. What has happened after 317 is that every individual Kashmiri has a grievance against government of India, which was not the case. You had groups, for sure. You had the separatists who had a problem. You had others also. You had soft separatists. PDP at one point was called the soft separatists. In fact, why the reason why it became such a thing, if NC had done the alliance, probably it would not, the reaction would not have been so adverse. But PDP was seen as a soft separatist party. Yeah. In fact, uh, that is how I remember, you know, everybody talking to me also, that how does the soft separatist ultra nationalist work? Yeah. But that is how, you know, so today, every Kashmiri that I meet has a personal grievance against India, saying that, look, you should not have done this. This is very, very unfair. That, I think, is the reason for silence. It's like something that has happened to you personally. Now, when I feel this, and I know, and I've written extensively on this, that 370 was nothing. It was just a fig leaf. It had no protection. It had been all eroded. 52 was fine. You had a different thing. It was a quasi-autonomous thing. It was uh, a federal, it was a asymmetric federation Kashmir was in that day. When I feel like that, imagine those for whom Dafa Tinsu Sattar was some kind of a thing that they say protect us. And suddenly that's gone. It becomes a grievance, a personal grievance. I think that's where the silence is coming from. It's a, you know, you have internalized this thing. When you dismiss a Farooq Abdullah, it doesn't get internalized as a personal affront to my sensibilities, to my ideology, to my beliefs, forget ideology, just to my sentiment. It doesn't get you road like that. But when you kind of, uh, so when you, when you dismiss a Farooq Abdullah or you, you know, put a Meba Mufti in, it, it doesn't personally kind of reach out to every Kashmir, which is why what you were saying that, you know, you, or people are saying nobody's bothered about them. It's not that. But in this particular element, what has happened is every single Kashmiri who I know feels a personal grievance against it. And that is where the silence is coming from. So last couple of questions, Dr. Drabu, uh, you said that the marginalization of the political parties has had the effect of also streng strengthening the separatists and uh, perhaps even militancy, would you say? I didn't, I said it will strengthen the separatist sentiment. I don't know if it will strengthen because Article 370 is, abrogation is only one part of a whole range of things that has, that has been done. Right. So you are having a strong, hard policy uh, against militants. So that is proceeding on its own. It has been on for quite some time, right? So, uh, so it's not about fueling separatists, but the sentiment. Mm -hmm. Because you are now seeing that something that was so dear to you has been uh, taken Take away or done away with, without even as much as a reference to you. So there are constitutional issues. There are issues of technicalities, legalities, legislative things. But there's also an element of a personal betrayal which one feels, you know, you know that uh, every Kashmiri feels that something personal. It has nothing to do with the act. It has to do with what 370 was presented to me as, as I was growing up, you know, Dafa Tinsu so Sattar. You know, it's like, this aggravation there time, of, yeah. there was but a the time when of separatist, yeah, This aggravation of separatist sentiment that you talk about, how do you see it unfolding? I don't know. I mean, I, we do know the thing is that it will just delay the process of restoring normalcy. I mean, it will kind of drag on for too long. But I was just saying that, you know, way back, I think it was 77 or 78, <clears throat> Sheikh Abdullah, who's probably the tallest leader Kashmir has produced, said in the assembly, there was some discussion in a newspaper, local newspaper, that 370, there were some changes were being made. And he stood up in the assembly, such was the resentment at that time. He stood up in the assembly and said, you know, because people had, it's become much larger in life, you know, <laughs> it was, you know, it was, 
it was a shadow which had become a silhouette so you didn't have but and you can't transform that uh, you know uh, impression to people who are you know generally for the older people with article of faith today the older people the senior citizens uh, feel they have been living in sin you know there is that whole crisis which we are going through so there's a psychological dimension and uh, there's a personal dimension so it's got all a little little messed up and uh, it's not looking very good thank you so much for your time dr drabu thank you for speaking to all the pleasure okay thanks very much thank and you i hope you subscribe to our youtube channel and please tell your friends and family <laughs> thank you thanks